yes, I do my nail and, and they were cackling um, when there was a, a customer mm -hmm. um, that, you know, she was wearing a scarf and, and, but they were not laughing at her, but she felt like they were laughing at her. So, um, yeah, it was, it was really difficult. Yeah. It's a different perspective because I'm looking at myself and I haven't experienced that until I put it on. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, wow, this is, it's very humbling. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, you will understand how people react. Yeah, I feel, now I understand their perspective. And, and it's, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's different coming from different background, you know, especially something that's not very considered normal, right. quote unquote. So, all right. So let's um go through chapter ten. Uh, let me share screen. Sorry. And this is not too long of a chapter. I think it's a decent size. What we should talk about is we should talk about the tools, like what we mentioned before. This deal is about what kind of tools that you want to use in certain scenario. And it's really important that you know how to use these tools. Um, I'm trying to in introduce you to EOK without getting into a lot of the programming side of the API. Um, so that way you can at least like bring it to your system and be able to explore. And they have great tutorial and documentation for you to use. I edit a couple of things on the notes. So after the class, I will update the latest version. I added a couple of links, but I'll show you what those are. So in this week, we're going to talk about different type of analysis. And this is part of your role as an analyst. So it's really important that you understand the type of things that you're looking for and the type of tools that you're gonna use. So um, it, it begins with talking about understanding and identifying security issues and how that impact the organization. Um, the cool thing is that you do have SIEM system that already has these tools that incorporated. But in the case that if you don't have that specific tool, you do have option so Splunk is a very popular tool in the industry. Um, you can get a free trial. I think I have it open on here. Do I? Maybe, but you, yeah, I do. Um, so you can, you can get a free trial version and then be able to um, look at how you can incorporate it, but you must use Universal Forwarder um, so when you install it on Linux or Windows or whichever system that you're testing, um, read the documentation. It will walk you through the process. And then um, you can find some resources, right? And some of the um, help that you can get, like the documentation is located here. And it walks you through on how to use like SOAR. We'll talk about SOAR. And then we'll talk, we'll look at like UBA, this is very popular now as we need to look at like how the users are using their systems and to, to build out our trend analysis. So there are a lot of resource, good resources like how to use Universal Forwarder, how to work with cloud. So they have really good, you know, things that you can, you can use as a reference. So it's really important that you see that. And then for EOK, um, we'll touch a little bit on elasticity. I actually um, incorporate that with my programming course because they do really well with API, but these are the technology that you can use for logging. So let's go through and answer the questions. So in the first question, it asks you, how can a security analyst determine, hello, hello. the organizational impact of a security event? And we touch on the infrastructure, um, how to really look at infrastructure, but we also need to determine the events that are impacting at the local level hi, and the global level. So that means that we have to differentiate the category of events. So if we're saying the local system is really pertaining to that, that physical system, and then on the global, we would need to think about domain, right? Like the hierarchy of our servers. 
to okay to be able to, to um um incorporate how this will impact at the the actual system or the hierarchy of our organization the systems right the server systems. Huh? yes you will how impact organization sorry I probably didn't finish my thought as I was very sleepy. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Um, so we, you know, in the notes, it talks about impacts and how that, you know, that can be um, changing depending on the type of event and then the, you know, your scope and your scale. But ultimately, you need to take a look at your system, your users, your services, your data classes, and this is a lot of data. And we're gonna we're gonna touch and we're gonna drill down some of the sub area. But even in each category, you're gonna have a lot of data in general. So you have to really understand how to use ingestion of data on how it's filtering out and what kind of data is valid data, right? So I'm actually working on a contextualized course of the analysis, like the statistical analysis side of cybersecurity as part of the an option for data science and an option for this this uh, certificate. And that's mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's really important because we what we're doing with the data is really to look at how that can impact our operations and our organizations. So where can you go and find security events? And this comes back to the very beginner level, right? Um, what kind of tools do you use to really identify the security events? So of course, we are gonna look at logs, right? Logs of security appliances, of systems, of servers. And then we'll talk about the aggregation technologies. And a lot of these are going to be not appliances, but software. Um, and so the the way that we would use the tools is, like I mentioned before, your, your security information management system is going to have some of the tools incorporated, right? But if it doesn't, or if you don't have access to that type of system, you can also use open source tools or proprietary tools. So Splunk, you can get a free trial version, but in an enterprise level, you have to pay for the license and it is a one-stop shop. So you do have the visualization of your statistical data. Um, and then it also categorize and allow you to really customize your dashboard to how you want your data to look. And then we're gonna talk about EOK stack, which is Elastic Search Lock Stash Kibana. This is really designed for it to look at web servers and a lot of the uh, network type of devices and to be able to visualize it. And EOK stack is free. There are great resources on their webpage for you to really, you know, go through and see how you can install and be able to use it. And of course there are tutorial. So I started, you know, showing this to the students um, maybe a year or two ago when I taught taught 30C and 30B. Um, but we're gonna touch a little bit on that today. I didn't have enough time to kind of drill down a little bit. So I will expand on this today's exercise in a later lab. So that way you can see how that's done. But at least we'll be able to use it or get it to the system. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Good, thank you. I was like expecting you to be here. And when I walked in, I was All right, sorry. Do you need to drive? Uh, you, yeah, you will. If you want to back it up, or you can download Cali. We use Cali today. The reason why I use Cali a lot is mostly in this field, that's what you use is Debian Linux um, for analysis. It's just easier to work with the tools. And then I'll, I'll share with you the type of tools that you can use um, with Windows 
right? Fairly minimal. A lot of them are proprietary. You can use Splunk and ELK with Windows. Um, and then, but in general, if you use Linux, you should be able to get the free version of it. Okay, so we talked about the first two questions and we're going over chapter 10, Michael, and then you're the assignment. So when you're looking at the impact, if it is a localized impact, for example, if we're looking at malware that's impacting the system, that's a localized impact. And that malware, for example, ransomware can be also global impact if it starts spreading, right? So you need to evaluate it from a, a standpoint that is immediately impacting the operation. So in, in handling the incident, you have to take a look at how that event is impacting the local system compared to the total impact in the organization as a whole. So we have to look at from the machine and then how that can be to the domain and then to the subdomain, and then we would move from the level of the single system to the hierarchy of our overall organization. And then it talks about trend analysis, and this is going to be your area. Understanding what's happening with the changes based on the normal level. Okay, so when we say baseline, that's basically the operational norms. And how do you do that? You're going to be able to compare that to what the industry is considered as norm or if they have historical data that you can use. And sometimes you don't have historical pattern, but you would need to do research and evaluate. So you, you would use like industry feeds. We talked about logs, right? In Linux, this is where you're going to find your log under var log. And that will probably be an exam question, right? Not just my exam, but the, the certification exam. In Ubuntu, you can find authentication log under auth.log. Um, so you would find that in Linux, you would find .log as the file extension. So it's fairly easy. In Windows, we would use Event Viewer. So that's typical, okay? So some screenshots are there. Um, for the firewall, you need to take a look at ports, protocol, action taking, very similar to what you see in network traffic analysis, okay? And then other firewall, we would look at rules and how that rules compare to industry practice. Proxy logs are also important. So let's go through and answer some questions. So why is trend analysis important in security operations? Um, and this could be your interview questions, right? Trend analysis provides an understanding of what is occurring across the organization, what's happening across, right? So what it, that's a generalized perspective of organization operation, basically. So that's what it's giving you. And then seeing how the change is from baseline or normal uh, for security events. So if you have security events, event, you would see how that can change the, the operation compared to what it normally would be. And for the logs, this is the type of files that we mostly deal with, right? Logs are used in security trend analysis from application servers or application themselves system, server, you would need to pull logs from firewall. WAF stands for web application firewall. And then we also need proxy logs because proxy acts as two things, to filter or to forward, right? It is a middleman or it is a blocker. So proxy is really good, very similar to a firewall, right? But it also functions as a forwarder. So you can see the coming through traffic and the stop traffic. So proxy logs are essential. Intrusion detection and intrusion prevention logs, very similar to what you've seen with firewall, what was denied, what was allowed, what type of traffic. So you're gonna see ports, right, IP addresses, source and destination, 
uh, where it's coming from, where it's going to, what was blocked, what was allowed. Now, application logs sometimes that would contain specific service for the application, and that's very important. So in the case, if you have some kind of malicious, you know, malicious uh, impacted application, you would see that, you know, there are initiated services that might not be in your baseline. So that will be an anomaly. Now, security software sometimes don't pick it up. However, a lot of the security tools are really good with the signature and the heuristics, so the behavior of how your application, your system, and your appliances should be behaving, right? Now, there are live services that you can purchase uh, to for engineers and security consultant to monitor this, right? outside of what you see with in-house. So you can be the analyst that do this, right? Um, I don't know if you know some security company that sells appliances. They pay their, their security architect and engineer about 140,000 a year just to, to do analysis with this stuff, right? To really build out trend analysis live as you go. So basically you monitor it and then, you know, and they do use AI, but they also have the human to check the AI. So, okay. So reference the notes in the textbook if you have it. So some of the things we talked about already, right? Um, your tools should be used to centralize and manage infrastructure that gives you less work. However, sometimes if you have isolated environment, you would have to use specific tool. Remember that when we test, we want to use virtual environment and virtual machines and virtual systems. So that way it doesn't impact our life operation. So some of the terms that they kind of threw out um, for this particular specific, uh, certification, like data enrichment. This is a way that we need to improve and refine data to improve our processes, right? And it is very business oriented, but re remember that when you're protecting the system, you're protecting the business, so. All right, so when you set your rule, so um, one of the things that the analyst would need to do is to be able to identify the, the areas that need rules and then to be able to write the rules into the system. And it would look like this. So your centralized tools are gonna be able to incorporate rules and you're gonna have aggregation, which is your, your ingestation of logs of your data. And then from the rules, you are going to send out notification for the system that are impacted and then respond to incidents. Right, that's the point in this whole CYSA, okay? So your correlation rules, basically it is a way that we would look at events and then match them based on the unwanted behavior. So the rules need to really address what is accepted. And I really, that's how I operate is I really look at the type of rules that are accepted. Like in your house, you set the rules for how people should behave and anything else you kick them out right? So this is how we should operate is we accept, right? We allow certain things and anything that's anomaly, we reject, okay? And that's a better operation than um, just keep the blocking because if you keep blocking, it's going to be a lot, okay? So it talks about that here. The only thing that you should concern about is the false positive. So that means that some events could be missed, but I really don't feel like we would achieve 100% no matter what we do, right? We would overlap solutions so that way we would get to the 99.99%, not just availability, but for security. And I truly believe that, you know, with that, like no matter what we try, there's always an alternate way to override it. So this is why the, the demand of this field is always changing. Right? It's always increasing and, and your skills are always changing. Okay. 
So um, the purpose of your SIEM rules, right? Your SIEM is a centralized management system for all your security. And it is a way for us to set up the rules, the criteria, how we want, you know, users, behavior, systems, applications, and appliances to act, right? So think of that as like the Supreme Court, right? In our country. And then you would have the appliance rules or other rules that are subsidiary to that centralized system. So it is a way that we can set alarm for unwanted action. And this might sound very reactive versus proactive, but a lot of the times in handling the incident is a reactive process. Right. So with that, we wanted to look at, and you can make prediction based on this, right? Based on what you see in trend, possible potential attacks or, you know, circumstances. So we want to detect early. And your book goes into SOAR. And as you look at Splunk documentation, you're going to see that they have categories of how you can address security orchestration, automation, and response. And this is how we operate now. We should streamline the process through automation because nobody wants to manually look through everything, a, a, a million things and find like some small, right? You can set the machine to do that. And that's what the computer is for. You can, security orchestration is a coordination of tasks, okay? And the response is to respond for incident. So the three elements or the three major components of SOAR, and you need to remember this for certification, is that we need to, number one, threat and vulnerability management. And that goes across for all areas in security, right? We need to look at what can potentially harm us and the weakness in our system. And then for the response is to respond to incidents, events, and that could be very highly impact or lowly impact. And then for the operation is for automation. Things that we can use to control and reduce the risk a little bit better. So for example, if I'm, I'm having wireless uh, network in my environment, I can potentially require the, the, the end devices to have security application when they're connecting to my network. And you can set up a health check policy for that and that's easily done, right? We can set up filtering system that automatically block or allow certain things and that's automation. So firewall really falls into this category, okay? And a lot of the security tools are also falling into multiple categories. So you have to really think about the three areas that you want to address in SOAR. So Splunk has their suite specifically working with this, right? The, the sub tools that you can set up for orchestration, automation, and response. So the two tools, or at least two tools, and in your notes, you there. This is all came from your notes. You can use Splunk, right? So for interview, they might ask you, like you know, how can you set up security for your business, right? And my my answer would be to be able to integrate SIEM and then to be able to use SOAR with SIEM. Right. <laughs> it's all an acronym game in this industry. So making sure that we know what this is. Right. So this is really address the processes in managing security. Right. And so rapid seven is one of the option. And, you know, all of these, you will be able to find some kind of free trial. IBM use Q radar. And they implemented AI in a lot of the integration for cloud these days. So, and then for the IT management system, um, you would see something like ServiceNow, which is a product, 
um, that you can find also integrated SOAR. So you can see all in one stop shop nowadays. I think that just because of, for the convenience and the, the demand for it, right? Uh, they will be able to sell the license a little bit quicker if they have more feature and more tools capability. All right, so to see SOAR, you can go to page three. And then we have to analyze endpoint data. So endpoint data really focus on malware analysis, okay? That means that the malware can impact the data at your endpoint systems. So endpoint system could be a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, a smartphone. And we talked in extent of reverse engineering, right? So really in the reverse engineering process, you need, need to take the code, which is the how the program is written, and the binary files. Usually the application would have the binary file. And you would use tools to be able to see what's in the code, right? And its behavior, okay? So one of the tools that you can use is the debugger. All IDE have a debugger. It's a way that you can set, a, let's say I wanted to only run the five lines of the code, right? That section of the code, you can actually set the stopper at a certain point, or you can step through the program one line at a time. So that's how they actually go through and, and look at the code. You would use the disassembler all application, you, you know, so if it's a C-based application, it uses a compiler and a compiler uses an assembler to compile. So you would use a disassembler and there are disassembler tools that are out there. It would break it down to the machine level code. Okay, see your Java. And then you can use a, a packer and unpacker. So in order to package the application, they would use a packer. Right, they would use so to make it like an exe or a, you know a dbg, some form of package, so that way I can install it on a certain OS, right? So you can use that to reverse it, to unpack it, and then um, use mon monitoring tools. So that would answer our question eight. Right, we would use disassemblers, debuggers, monitoring tools, unpackers. We would uh, use an analysis tool for our code and our binary files. This will allow us to pull apart the malware packages and to determine their behavior, their functionality, and their construction. A lot of the times, developer would sign in their malware, that means that they would put some kind of information about the creator, right? Or hint of who creates it, okay? So we might we might find the originator or where it comes from um, or how it's passed through. And so understanding its functionality is gonna help us know how to stop it, right? And when you work for anti-malware company, this is what they do, right? When when people report a malware or if they do have an, an affected file or the actual malware file, right, that gets submitted and then it goes through um, a, a screening process where they would be able to look at certain signature or heuristic of the malware, if it's not, they're not able to determine based on what's already been known, it is considered unknown. And then the unknown malware would go through the process of reverse engineering where their engineers would sit down and go through these things. And that could also be analyst. And so when you evaluate malware, heuristic is really about behavior. So you need to decompile the binary file. That file is used for compilation. And so when we're looking at C-based language like C++ or Java, right? It uses a, a compiler. 
And once you decompile it, you're going to compare it with examples. So this is why you see variation of certain type of malware, like, you know, you have Trojan and then variation of the Trojan. How can they tell? It's because of the heuristic, right? The behavior that's it's like a Trojan. Or it would be a rootkit, like a rootkit, right? So that means that they would run the program in the container and then in the virtual environment to look at the behavior. So you would always, and even for Python and Java, and you know, you can set up virtual environment to test your code. Any question? Okay, so heuristic information is here. This is where you would find the answer on page three, the bottom. And um, there's some additional information about tool-based analysis. So what this really means is you can have online tools like VirusTotal or um, even some of like Kapersky. There's a lot of different tools online that you can use to analyze the malware if it's not known, um, or you can report to them and then they will be able to assist you. Okay. All right, uh, memory analysis. A lot of fo this focus is about application performance and your system performance. Without RAM, your system will die and fail, right? So we would need to look at the type of memory usage for our application, the processes that uses our RAM, and then the available memory. So for number 10, it asks you why is memory analysis important? Because it gives you the overall information about your system performance, how the application used the memory, and the available memory. This allows the organization to also scale based on the needs of the system. So that means that when I have a system that's processing or that's running a lot of application or running a lot of processes, then I want to make sure that I have sufficient memory allocation for that system, right? Especially your servers or even your database, okay? But in the case where if my system used minimal amount of memory, I also need to understand that and be able to allocate costs somewhere else, right? But a lot of times memory analysis is really tied back to performance. So Microsoft has their, um, so it used to be a network monitor, but they do have performance monitors. So Perfmon is very popular in their server. Um, and you can use Perfmon to be able to detect like, you know, your uh, your processes, you can graph out some information and that can be integrated with your server itself. So you can run it concurrently and it will be live monitoring. And then on your desktop, what do you use to monitor your, your, your memory or your Windows? Task manager. manager, exactly. Okay, very good. And then for Linux system, right, you can look at process ID, uh, you can ta you do task list, and then you can find Destro Task Manager in, in Linux. And so for application, we would need to look at how the application behaves, okay? And the way that we can detect anomalous app behavior or something that's not normal, that's irregular. We would use tools to evaluate its behavior through functionality and signatures. And we would compare that to our norm, which is our baseline. And we would also use checklists to look at the configuration of the system and potential problems. So manually, we would do a checklist, right? And through our automated tools, we would be able to identify some of the issues through behavior and signature. 
a lot of application use certificates, right? Or or some form of signature. So you would need to be able, you would be able to identify that through some of the tools. Any question? All right. So this chapter, we can do a lot with this, right? Uh, there's so many different type of tools. Okay. So anomalous an anomalous behavior is here. You can find this on page four of your notes. This is the screenshot for your network monitor. This is what it looks like. Okay. Looks very similar to your task manager. Um but for the file system monitoring, you can use Tripwire. They've been around for a long time, along with OSEC. Okay. And then for the user or entity, you would use UEBA. Okay. So how can I find some of the resources online? Okay, so I show you Splunk. So there is a link um, that I will share with you on the updated notes. And there is a uh, Digital Guardian, they offer the, the use of um, UEBA analysis. And so if you go to their website, right, you would see. And then there's, you know, it talks about how you can compare the difference between this and that, the best practices. And then there's a link for you, UEVA tools and processes, and it will take you to a list of tools. So Gartner is the one that, that really spearhead a lot of these things. So when you see this, you're going to see that there's like a lot of information from Gartner. And so if you have internal threat, like an employee, there are tools that you will be able to analyze. And sometimes that would, you know, so it talks about that here. Okay. okay. So for network analysis, um, I think if you took forensic class, you're very familiar with this website. Okay, so uh, malwaretrafficanalysis.net has a bunch of tutorials. So you can, sorry, I'm gonna click that and then you can go through here. They have like the Wireshark one where you can take a look at how you can look at Wireshark and then you can look at malware. Um, I think, you know, for my forensic class, we use a lot of some of these, like their resources, right? But check out their tutorial. So some sometimes they have videos, sometimes it's just screenshot like this. So it's it's good to kind of take a look at what they have here. And this is very useful for you, actually. Okay. All right. So for 11, it says for application analysis, we already talked about anomalous. For 12, which is what tool can be used to analyze the user behavior? Um, we would use the tools that are for user entity behavior analytics. It's, can, it's called UEDA. And that can come from uh, in a form of web base, or it would be something that you can install on the system. So the area of network is a lot. We would um, use network sniffer like Wireshark. And there are tons of other ones that you can use, but we would be able to evaluate the content of the packets, 
on what was sent and what was received. The overall flow of the packets or the traffic. So we will we are going to take a look at conversations today, right? Through in Wireshark, and then the protocol to use for individual packets. Sometimes it's also good to look at payloads. So why do we need to take a look at payloads though? What's payload useful for? So when I'm looking at network sniffer like Wireshark, why do I care to look at payloads? Anyone know? Sometime payload. Provide some information that could be in plain text. Sometimes a lot of a large payload can indicate an attack. So it's important that you take a look at payloads and how individual packets, if it's large in size, you need to take a look at the content along with its header. Okay, and trailer. All right. So one of the areas in the network that we need to evaluate is going to be your domains, right? Um, I think we did a lab a while back where we take a look at the, the legitimate domain. Um, I think I addressed this in most of the security classes that I teach. So there are websites that you can submit the URL to, and it will tell you if that URL is valid coming from a, a legitimate hosted domain. If it's a top level domain or it is a, a sub level domain, um, that's important. And the credit, sometimes some website would give you the scoring of that particular domain. So we need to evaluate why is that? Because there are malware that makes fake domains, right? It's designed to put up these fake websites for people to access and it's short lived. So it doesn't take very long for it to self-delete and then start a new one again. Basically, they use bots for that, okay? So it just hop around and it variously create domains in, 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 in different areas. And so in the world right now, we have approximately 9 million websites hosted, right? And growing, probably 15 by now. My, my data might be off a little bit. So that means that we could potentially have a lot of websites that are not legitimate, right? Um, so one of the algorithms that you need to know is called the DGA. And DGAs are tools that are used for malware. And this tool is used to generate domain names and the, the domain names are seen. So it would go from place to place and be able to have different websites. And DGAs generate water holes, and water holes are basically sites that allows users to, or lure users to download malware. Some of these sites look very legitimate, or it looks very close to the legitimate website. So basically, it is an automated tool to capitalize on domain registry. It's fairly an easy code to write, probably. I'm sure that you can find source code only. So all you need to do is register the DNS and through the registration process, you just need to have an admin account, right? Just like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it also take over certain records of a, a, an existing DNS and modify it, depending on the DGA. It's just a category, but you, there are DGAs that that take advantage of weak websites. And sometimes, you know, they could traverse through or if they use default login or something like that. 
this is called leave in the sense of security, where they can just, just take over the whole domain as it is. Yeah, we'll talk about A records and then triple A records. But because ul ultimately a public DNS is tied to one file. Right? If it's IPv4, it's the A record. If it's IPv6, it's the triple A record. And in the DNS attack, you just need to get a hold of the record and modify it. Or recreate the record. Right. That's not like a familiar attack. Yeah. So so if you if you know, in the case that you know, if if it is malicious where it needs to perform an attack to take over domain. Well, a lot of the times they just they just use low tier domain cheat, right? The bots just generate it continuously. Or let's say that they'll have it up for, you know, so many hours or days to see if they have certain hits and then take it off and hop it again. Because why do they do that? Because it's a lot harder to detect. It's not permanent, it's temporary, and it changes all the time. Okay. So that's the game, right? So you got to take a look at if the name is legitimate. Um, and then there are scoring websites that you can put it through. Google say, Google does have the safe browsing. So you can go to safebrowsing.google.com. And it would take a look at the content and where that domain is hosted. You can also use uh, Seltzer. Right. So what they do is they actually have a, an ongoing growing list. So if things that look suspicious, it gets added to the database and it checks against that database, basically. OK, some of them, I think some of the website it uses a crawler or a spider system where it actually spider out and and it evaluates based on like, you know, um, how the content is set up or where it's hosted, where the IP is coming from. So depending on some tools that these, some of these tools are actually integrated with your SIEM or, you know, like the all-in-one suite tool like Splunk. Okay, so that brings us to FastFlux. And FastFlux DNS is a way that, that in general automate registration of domain and deregistration of domain. So we talked about DGA before, and this can be integrated with DGA. So the single flux is to be able to use address by using the A record. So A record is basically a file that associates an IP address of a domain to its domain name. And the double flux, what it does is it's using the same thing, but it's also setting up the DNS zone and it's it keep registering and deregistering. So it's a hot, lot harder to detect. So that means that when we when we're looking at fast flux as a tool in the industry, right? Potentially it can cause us challenges because it's disguised the DNS A record. And it would do that, the, the DNS A record only lived for a very short time for that particular domain. So that could change very quickly. So in a single flux, if they're using the single flux, the DNS record is short lived and it is disguised. In the double flux, the, the public DNS continuously being registered and deregistered, which caused the tools to be confused, right? Because if you have a public address and a URL or a domain name associated with that address, but then when you scan against it, it changed again, right? So that would be harder to, to really pin down or permanently identify. Any question? Yeah, so they would spoof the domain name if they buy it, if they even buy the actual name, if they go to Google domain. Yeah, or sometimes it's forwarded to a low level domain, right? Um, and then, you know, so 
it, they would spoof something that would look legitimate and then use a forwarder and forward it to, because you just have to set up a DNS server. So forward with masks to Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So like Bell's Fargo use a forwarder to say Wells Fargo, something like that? Yeah. yeah. I see. But the intention behind that, you, you know, you really need to, so for malware distribution, they can just use something that would consider popular, right? Uh, and it would play on the social engineering aspect to be able to distribute malware. Like, you know, if there's a game that's being released that, that the user would download or a movie or something like that, they can just embed it into a file uh, that looks like the movie so they can use the Trojan to redistribute it. Uh, and, you know, as long as the, the, the website look legitimate enough, a lot of the time people will have that trust. And then, so, you know, when you run a scan on certain these certain type of website, sometimes you would see that the the trust logo is not actually a logo, it's just an image. You know how the the e trust digital sign logo sometimes because when you yeah when you right. when you digitally sign that you trust this website, it will say e trust or you know this is signed by Verisign or something like that. Sometimes you know because it's not trusted. What they do is they take an image and they inlay it into the HTML because that's easily done is you just load it as an image instead of an actual signature. So when you use the the, the scanning tool, it's going to scan against that website. It's going to tell you this is found on this website. This is not a trusted website. This is just an image or, you know, their hopes or faith or. Yeah. Would it also on the URL, would it Google on the left hand side of the domain show red for unverified? Is that the case? Yeah, sometimes, like but that? sometimes, you know, uh, people can be very crafty in right. how they okay. set it up. So if they do their homework and they, they thoroughly clean up everything, it might not see it right away, right? For a long time, it might right uh give it time but because you know it's able to check more more in the definition of what is set in the configuration but if it's not then but there are plenty of websites that are okay but then it's not trusted right by google or you know so all of those can be false positive false negative in some sense no tools are perfect this is why i think you know, even with the AI on, on how much data we feed it, it will get close to decent. It will be good. Um, it will uplift a lot of the things that we do, uh, but we still have to, you know, have a double look, right? We would have to be the one that's looking behind it and see um, if the decision tree is on the AI is accurate. Yeah, because you know when I I'm I'm taking machine learning class, and when they talk about that, is you know a lot of the times they're aiming for like eighty percent accuracy or higher. <laughs> so a lot of the times when people say AI, they assume that it's very accurate, but ultimately you're gonna have a a, a range scope in how the developer wants that AI to perform, right? So the algorithm can give you about, you know, maybe 75% or higher. Um, and that could vary, sometimes a little lower. It really depends on the criteria that you give it. So, all right. So, um, and and in the, in the notes, I also included information about NetFlow. NetFlow is also good um, as a way where we can look at, you know, where the data has been, where it's going to, especially when you work with data in motion, the majority of the things, like 80% of your, your infrastructure operation is data in motion, like data and email and attachment, uh, data being downloaded, data being uploaded, data being transmitted over the network. So that's what we see as data flow. And we should be able to visualize it. Um, you might be able to see the peak time where you're going to have a lot of data flow during operation and the type of system that are associated with the data flow. And so that's really important because 
you know, data is assets and a lot of your data is sensitive. So especially when we're dealing with healthcare um, or personal identifiable information. So where should I put NetFlow or the application to scan these things? On your network system, on your appliances, switches, routers, firewall. Okay, so you need to use the, the tool to monitor those so that way you can have a better understanding of where your data is going. Okay, so for 18, uh, this goes to, into your, so here's NetFlow tools, analysis of email. So there is a, a DNS checker for email analyzer. So you can, there are a lot of different tools, but if you want to do a quick check, to see if the email is legitimate or not. If your Google, your Gmail or your Outlook is not picking it up, right? Because a lot of the times when they set up, you know, like a, a an email server, usually they would put security tool or criteria. If you work for organization, you can use what is my ip.com and they have an email header analyzer. If you took forensic class, we went into extension of this. So all the forensic tool actually start with the email header. What it does is it's looking at the email header. Do you guys remember what's in the email header? So it has to, so let's think about like, let's take this into the analogy of like sending a, a package, like a real package through UPS or FedEx, right? So you have that scan code on there. And, and on your label, it's going to tell you where it's coming from and where it's going to, right? How do they track your package? Right? So when they scan it, it's going to say, oh, at Louisville, you know, or in Seattle or wherever city that they scan it, right? So what the email header does is very similar to that. The email header contains all the servers that are involved in the transmission process. So when I'm sending an email from my account to your account, in between, there might be many servers or just two, right? So let's say that I'm sending from mvc.edu to, uh, you know, my client, right? Or you. So that might involve a, a, another, a few more servers in between to forward your email. So it includes the information of those servers, the addresses of those servers, right? Um, and so for the malicious email, you would be able to, you should look at those servers because a lot of the times it's generated from their control server, okay? But if they impersonate the person, it's going to come from, you know, whoever that they impersonate. And a lot of times that's a lot easier. So a lot of the phishing email, comes from impersonation. They basically take over someone's e email, right? You guys ever receive RCCD is targeted a lot because you always get those fake employment email, right? Like sign up today, you can get a job for $5,000 a week or something like that. But they're going to make it close to realistic now because people don't click it if it's just like way too tempting, right? are way too unreal, like uh, 5,000 a week. I would not click that because I don't think that's real, right? But they would say $500 a week. All right, also signature block. Um, this is gonna allow you to look at phishing attacks um, and then whether the signature is legitimate or not. So to answer 18, is this what should be assessed when evaluating suspicious emails? Email payload? email header, email content, and signature block. Those are the four things that you should look at. So the forensic tools that we see or a lot of these email scanning tools, that's what they look at. And so on top of using detection tools, and security tools for our email. 
and you know, the administrator of, of email, they can also set up criteria filtering, right? Um, we can block email from a certain server, right? So if, you know, there is a database that exists of all the malicious server, right? Phishing email server, server. So basically they gather all of the information and they build out a database of potentially what could be bad. So those servers might not exist or they still are. So you can set up a way to block it. So some of the tools that you can use is called Domain Keys Identify Mail, DKIM. You can also use Sender Policy Framework where that's coming from. So if the server is malicious, we can block it. Domain-based message authentication. So that means that, you know, in order to send a message, they must authenticate to that particular domain. And then also reporting mechanism where, you know, we can set up an automatic way to report malicious email traffic and then conformance, which is called DMARC. So for 20, in an organization, you can allow and reject email from a certain server by using SPF and filtering rules on the firewall. Or sometimes the server, you can also set that up. So they have ways that you can set up like, you know, uh, key terms, or you can set up certain rules, right? From, from a certain place or going to a certain place. So for example, I cannot send email uh, with social security number in RCCD. If I type it with the dashes and it looks like social security number, it's gonna block me. So basically they're setting up rules to be able to prevent me from sending personal identifiable information and that reduces data leakage information or data leakage issue. Okay. So coming back to the notes, you can find email attacks right there, right? DKIM, what DKIM is. So it uses a signature for body and header. So that way, you know, kind of just to ensure that that message is safe, okay? But keep in mind that when you implement a lot of overlapping security solutions, a lot of, sometimes, you know, you would face some performance uh, latency. However, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to address as needs. Okay, so once we're done with our assignment, make sure that we save and upload it. If you miss anything, I can scroll back up. All right, download the lab. And then we're gonna do some part with Wireshark and then we're gonna work on ELK stack. So that way you can at least get started with understanding uh, how to bring it to your Linux system and what kind of requirement that you need. Okay. So for the lab, you would use Kali. Uh, you can download Kali VirtualBox or you can use the ones that are on your drive. Maybe better to copy onto the desktop and use it there and then back it up again, uh, whichever is easy for you. By this time, you, all of you should know how to use uh, Kali VBox. Okay. So once we have it started successfully, we're gonna log in. Okay, so login is Kali Kali. And I'm not using terminal yet, right? So here we are in Kali. 
we're gonna run Wireshark. And yes, I could have just done all of this in terminal, but what I want to show you is the graphical user interface of it in in Kali. I'm sure that some of you already used this before in Windows and Kali. Uh, but the analytics on it is really good these days. It's quite an improvement from where how it started way back. Right. So you're gonna click the application, which is the dragon. And you are going to go down to uh, sniffing number nine, sniffing and monitoring, and you should see Wireshark there. And of course, you can always search for it as well. So by default, your VM is going to use F0, which is your Ethernet connection. And you are going to see the interfaces listed below, right? You can select the type of interfaces that you want to use to scan. And Wireshark now allows you to do Bluetooth as well. So you're able to scan that. Um, so I wanted to select F0. And we need to put in the type of filter we want because it's a lot. Yeah, and it will not go. So you are going to put in port 80. And you would click it and you would click start. Sometimes it doesn't show. It says it will go on Firefox and open up some. Website. Yeah, but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't show traffic. You can just open up some web pages like YouTube or something like that. But yeah, because you you generate traffic. Mm -hmm. So make sure that we open up so we can go to Wikipedia. Well, maybe we can open up Cali Docs. Maybe we can open up Exploit DB. <laughs> There's a bunch of tabs that Cali already put there. So make sure that you open up websites. Uh, okay. Listen, all these graphics are going to pop up on large part of the screen, right? No, not always. Depending on uh, what you're using. Yeah, so some websites, I'm only on 80. Right, this one like export DB, it's HTTPS, so that's four four three, right? Um, but if I go to certain website that's not, uh, you would see, right? Yeah, you can do that. You should be able to see your loop back. And then you want to let it go. So basically, you're building data right now for your, your network, right? You're gathering your data for your network. And um, so in in Wireshark, if you, you can parse your data into multiple things. Uh, you can do it in CSV, which is, you know, it looks like a, a spreadsheet. So that would be popular if you want to use it with like Python automation. Right. Um, so if I write a script to be able to to outside of, you know, to look for certain things and or plug in certain things for automation, I can do that. Um, but with EOK, you can use JSON. OK, so data um, EOK work with JSON, YAML, and also I think it does CSV, but not too well. But JSON is the ideal file type that you want for your data. So basically, I'm going to have a file in .json uh, that contains all my traffic. That's what I want. Okay. So at some point, you are going to um, stop, right? After about five minutes, you're going to stop your, your uh, sniffer. And then you are going to look at the statistics. 
Okay. And it's actually pretty decent, Wireshark, that they give you a lot of the statistics already been uh, in organizing columns and roles and everything. Okay, so let's say I stop it now. And then I go to statistic and I can, you know, there are different options. So we're gonna click on conversations. <clears throat> And um, for the conversations, how many conversations were captured, right? To be, did I tell you to click? Oh, not just that. <coughs> so in, the, in, you know, when I ran this earlier, it's a little different because it all depends on what kind of traffic you're generating. So basically, if I click on the IP addresses, I can see more details. But in this case, it's only my conversation with the web servers, right? Depending on how many websites you open, okay? So here, I only see one with using this address. But if I click IPv4, what I would see is I'm requesting services from these, right? These web servers. Okay. So look at the first page first, and you would see from my address A to address B from destination to source, right? 180 pack. Uh, packets, and then B is responding with 103. I'm sorry, 108, not 108. And that's over a certain duration, and it tells you the size. So when you work with Wireshark for Sniffer, right, overall, you kind of have to drill down on what you're specifically looking for. In our case, if we're doing network analysis, we need to take a look at the traffic, right? Who's sending and who's receiving. And in our case, we are looking at certain port, like port 80, okay? From a certain system to another system. I forgot, this, there should be a question mark here. So answer the question, then you're going to click on IPv4. You're going to look at the first entry, right? And that could be different between yours and mine, depending on, you know, how we're using the traffic or we generate the traffic. So look at your IP address. So automatically, I should know that my, this is what the source is my system, right? 10.0.2.15. And to this destination B. So for my first entry, I have 107 packets. Yours might be a little different. Okay, so it gives you the packet, the packet size, how many packets. Okay. So answer those questions. Then what I want to show you is I want to take this data and I wanted to bring it, put it onto JSON, right? I'm going to show you to do it on the GUI side and we're going to do it on the t shark side. So we're going to do here. And as you can see, it can parse it into three types of data, like I said earlier, okay? So your raw data is going to go into as JSON. Then what we're gonna do is we are gonna filter out some of the data that we can see. And this is important because if you don't do this, you're gonna get a lot, right, in a, in a very large network. So you are going to 
go back to Wireshark, you close this, you go to statistic, and then I have you go and look at uh, IPv4 statistic and destination imports. So go down to the bottom and then destination imports. And then this is the, all the information I get. Sometimes that is more, but you can put in your port filter. Oh, I'm sorry, TCP down for it. And as you type, it's going to pop up. So you can just click it. Click apply. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking for port 80 TCP or, right, port 80 UDP. And it gives you the statistic percentage, okay? So the destination ports to this, that's 100%. So I know, or, you know, you would see there's, IP address and the port and the percentage. So this is a way that we can filter out specific port and look at the statistic for that port. So list some of the IP addresses that you see responding to my requests, right, or our requests at 100%. So I do see some of them. It varies, too, on what site you visit. So that means that I know those server supports, right, HTTP, which is not secure. Then um, we are gonna close that. We're gonna go into the DNS side. So close this. We're gonna go to statistic and then we're gonna go to DNS, which is in the middle. And so on the DNS, you can drill it down to certain topic. So here, what we're going to do is, um, huh. oh, yeah, so we are going to select the query. And the... Yeah, when I tested it before, it actually lists. Do you, do you guys have like yeah. the A record? Yeah, on mine, it doesn't show for some reason. Weird. But you should get some kind of A record and quadruple A record there. Yeah, it's, it's weird how it doesn't give me the statistic for the DNS like I expected. But... Yeah, mine too. Yeah. Just save and we ran it. And earlier I didn't even I didn't even generate too much.
be stopped now. Let me look at the statistic for DNS. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's resolving. I don't know why it's not showing. It just lists a hundred percent, but it doesn't give you the A record. Just strange. Let's stats. Load settings. New type. It's not seeing the query. Yeah, I'm not getting, it should show your percentage for your A. Maybe it didn't get, maybe I have to let it run a little longer, but earlier it didn't, it didn't show that. Okay, well, I guess I wanna show you the A record. It's not. Yeah, it should show you have response and the payload size. So if you can't answer it, that's fine. You can skip that. Okay, so one of the things that you can do, um, if you go to ELK, they would give you information about T-Shark, which is Wireshark. Um, and T-Shark can be ran with the ELK. Elasticsearch mapping is a way that you can take the data from Wireshark um, or T-Shark, and then you can bring it into Elasticsearch, okay? So let's show you so this is their web page and they kind of walk you through so the whole point is that you can capture your traffic and then you can you know pcap is basically the file that wireshark cranks out but you want to use the json file and then take that json file and let it let um, EOK ingest it and then you will be able to filter out some of the data right like port and IP address and then get Kibana to give you the visual okay. and then they give you some information this is where I obtained the information for your lab so to to work with the API, you can simply use T Shark as you already have Wireshark installed. So basically, we're telling the system that we are going to scan the Ethernet adapter using Ethernet adapter, and we are going to output a, a file called packets.json. Right? 
Another way that you can do this is you can generate a cap and you can take a capture file, which is the one that we, we did, right? You can just replace the name and you convert it into a JSON file. So there are two ways is if you already have a captured file, whatever the name of your, your capture file is, replace that and then put it into a JSON file. But it has to be in a JSON file. Okay. And then once you have that, what you can do is they talk about how you can go through and then you can set up certain fields that you want from the file, right? And this is where you would see YAML being used. So YAML is a language that is used to kind of plug in some of the field information or, or and, you know, working with the JSON file. So what you can see is that in JSON, we can specify like a certain um, string or text information by integrating it like this, okay? So after you have your JSON file, which is packets.json, what you want to do is you want to put it into uh, your EOK application using the port 9200. So EOK, Elasticsearch, Lock, Stash, and uh, Kibana specifically work with port 9200. Okay. And then it talk a little bit more about ingesting um, and how Lockstash work. Okay. I previously uh, wrote a lab with Python to incorporate some of this for cybersecurity, right? I was going to use it, but I didn't want a lot of programming for you guys. So, But when you visualize the data, it's what look like this. So we're going to try to get to as far as we can today. And then I'll expand on this on another lab. Okay, so the first thing we need to do, right, after we generate our JSON file is we are going to bring in EOK. EOK. And in order to do that, you need a, a good privacy key, right? This is a, a way that we would be able to use Elasticsearch. Um, and you have to generate a key ring. So for any kind of API, you have to have an API key in order to access the application that is web-based. So uh, this is a way that we would generate the key. All right. So open terminal, right? And then you can do a copy and paste or type it out. So I'm gonna generate the JSON file, paste that in here. And so this is actively running. If you leave it like this, it's just gonna keep going forever. And as it goes, your JSON file is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So keep in mind that if you want to monitor in Linux when you run it like this, because as long as you have Wireshark installed, T-Shark is Wireshark, okay? You can also use Wireshark, Wireshark, right? So if you call Wireshark-I, F0, and then how you want to generate, it still works, okay? So now if I want to stop it, I have to cancel or kill the process, right? Or I can just, you know, So it tells you here that your, your, your PCAP NG is going to be in the TMP directory. Under, so this is where you're, you're going to find your capture, okay? So this is how you run it with T-Shark. 
And then if we want to pause, let's cancel it. Okay. Then what we're going to do is now we have the file. We're going to do a curl and we're going to generate the ring. I think I did this earlier just to test it here. And then put in your Kali password. I already have it, so it prompted me this, but you shouldn't get this prompt. You it just goes to the next line. Oops. Okay, so if you have a key, you can generate another key. Then um, what we're going to do is we are going to create the source list. Um, and this is the whole, this is the whole command. Okay. So we're going to make a source list file. Then we're going to do an update. And once your update goes through, this will take a few minutes or seconds. Then you're going to install Elasticsearch. Okay, so keep in mind that when you do ELK, they are three separate tools combined into one stack. Elasticsearch is a way that we can screen out our data, right? Logstash can be used to filter data. So Elasticsearch can read the data and um, look for certain things in data. Works well, right? Uh, Logstash works really well, hence the name Logstash, right? It's really designed to, to ingest logs. So you can look at filter out certain thing for your file. And then what you're gonna do is you are going to use Kibana to, uh, to read your file or to visualize your file. Okay. So once you have your update, you're going to install Elasticsearch. For pseudo, did you generate your key successfully? You update? Yeah. Try it again. It should be fine. Pseudo app. You can try app get install. But it should app install should be fine. Make sure it's not misspelled. Elastic search. And then we're gonna use nano to modify our YAML file. YAML is actually really cool. You can create the file and, and for automation and have it plug in to things. Is it still getting an error? Okay. Make sure there's not a, a syntax error. Yeah. So when we're in nano, we're just going to go down and we're going to look for our... Um, Yeah, and the network dot host, and you're gonna change it to local host. That's basically your your host name, right? You can also use where is. Oh, 
Okay. I use the control W here, network.host. It shows this IP. You can use your IP, but I think localhost works best. Yeah, when you work with nano, if you want to, if it's a big file, right, your configuration file, you can use control W to do like the search and then type in the keyword and it will find it. Where it is? So once you have the localhost change control X, yes, and save it, make sure we see. I think I might have not put that step down, right? Yeah. So we got to add this in the same file. Control plus X. Yes. So at 30, once you modified the file, you got to make sure you save it. And then we're going to start Elasticsearch. System control failed because the control process exited. Journal Elasticsearch service detail. Job for elastic service failed because of the control process exited with an error code. An application error, huh? Let's see if it does. I think you can also run. So if you're getting a thing like this, let me find out why it's doing this. I think, I think that the the firewall or or possible that there's things that are blocking it. Oh, did it crash? Yeah, you can run Kibana without the Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch, in order to really expand on this, if you read their documentation, right? You can use it to specify like the type of field that you want. Hmm. Which one? Yeah, I, I'm getting an error for that. Uh, 429. Yeah, for here? Yeah. this right and then you do control w and then you type in network you, you go down yeah yeah you take out the 192 error where are I think you can also, because it says the default list of hosts is 127.0.0.1. The port is 9200. I wonder if you have to use, instead of local host, you have to use the 127. Yeah, that's that means it, it enabled it. 
So just go to the, the next command, the next part, right? Yeah, it's still loading. Yeah. Yeah, your smart or I don't know why, I think, I don't know. I modified, yeah, so you just change this right here. It's under the network section. I'm gonna tweak this a little bit. Let's try. Or maybe it's IP. Was it 15? Yeah. Save it. See, it will start with its own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mine is just, I think what it is, I don't know. Every time I demo, like it worked fine when I tested it at home. I'm like, oh, great, cool. And then I come here, it tests fine before class. And then when I demo, it's like, it just went out the door. <laughs> it's fine. You guys get the point. Yeah. All right. So um, we need to save, once we modify this, you, you know, I skipped the lock stash. You can take a look at how you can integrate lock stash. All you do, you can search ELK stack, Wireshark, and it will come up, okay? They kind of skip some of the things, right? They just show you, oh, this is what it's supposed to look like, but you you would need um to kind of activate this. But, okay, in Sakibana, okay? All right, I'm glad that you guys' things work. And then we would enable Kibana. And then we would start Kibana. Okay. But what you need is, I think I'm missing two steps. Um, if you, I'm assuming Kali doesn't have the firewall, but if you have Linux firewall, you have to, in, you have to allow the, port 9200 otherwise it's gonna block it for sure okay but i think it worked like this um so you would need to and so for your domain you can just put local host and it should be fine because the way that you access your your uh let me check But it should be able to load the HTTP. Yeah, you gotta try it. Sometimes it's the symbol. But for Kibana to work, so I, I have used this on a um, to integrate it with the API and then on the Linux system um, as an application with GUI. So once it loads the site, you should be able to. So try it with your host name, your server name, put in local host. And then for your configuration, Right, look for it. So your your do it might be Cali right here. So if you can get here and show your status, that will be great. <laughs> Who knows what happens at MVC? <laughs> when I demo this in Python, it worked fine with Ubuntu, and I was, <laughs> but. And then lastly, so once you have everything in place, right? If your Kibana works, then you would let it read the JSON file. So whatever the name of your JSON file, which is what we name it as packets, then let it read it. Okay, so you would do the curl and then import it. And then you can stop there. Pause the recording. 
Host name or local host or yeah, local host. You can type host name in the command line and it will tell you your system name. Host name? Just host name. Okay. I think Windows and Linux are the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in Windows, if you type that, it, it gives you your computer name. Right now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, same, same in Linux. Uh, Let me stop recording.